I think we've, we've all been there, and, and I think as we think about our words, our, 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 our mouth, we're talking about this week, I think we, we've all could agree that we've all said things that, that have even shocked ourselves, haven't we? Right? We, we've said things, and we thought, I, man, I, I didn't even know I was capable of saying that. Where, where did that come from? Where did I get that? Why did I say that? Yesterday, we, we considered the fact that our words are powerful. What did we say was in the power of the tongue? Somebody help me out. Life and death, all right? Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said life and death are in the power of the tongue. We looked at James, and James tells us that this thing that contains the power of life and death is incredibly difficult to control. In fact, we can't do it ourselves. And even our own, even in our own way, we, we are shocked many times by what we say, by what comes out of our mouth. And we probably were told sometime when we were growing up that we should do what with our mouth? Wash it out with soap. Wash it out with soap. What else? <laughs> what it, watch it, shut it, all right? <laughs> yeah, and that's, sometimes that's not a bad, bad bit of advice. Um, but we, we've been told to watch our mouths, right? How many of you, were ever, your mom or dad ever told you to watch your mouth? All right. How many of you, you know, when your parents told you that, you either thought or said something sort of sarcastic, right? Like, I can't see my mouth. I, I can't imagine you saying something sarc sarcastic, Eric. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about lying tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. If someone tells you to watch your mouth, it, it, it might work in the sense of in that moment you might stop saying what you were saying or you might refrain yourself from saying what you were about to say, but it doesn't really fix the problem, does it? Right? Watching our mouth doesn't really fix the problem. Because here's the thing that I want us to consider this morning. Our mouth, our tongue, it's incredibly powerful. It has the power of life and death. It can control and dictate the entire course of your life, as James says. But here's the thing. It doesn't work alone. It has an accomplice. It has a wingman, if you will. It has a powerful influencer. It has someone who is directing it. And that is the issue that I want us to look at this morning. Because if we're ever going to master our mouth, if we're ever going to come to a place where we experience God's control, God's empowerment over our words, and that should be our desire, we need to deal with our tongue's partner in crime. I'm going to begin by uh, looking at Luke 6.45 this morning. If you have your Bible, we're going to look there. And, uh, and look at what Jesus says, uh, because he answers this question that we often ask, where did that come from, right? We say something, we say, well, where did that come from? Well, Jesus is going to tell us in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow, your translation may say the abundance, but it's that idea of, of this well, this overflowing. Out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. So let's just think about that. He says, for the, out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying where your tongue gets its material is your heart. And so when you say something and you think, where did that come from? I don't, and, and sometimes, have you ever have you ever said something, wish you hadn't said it, and wanting to soften the blow of it, you say, I I'm sorry, I, I don't know where that came from. Did you ever say something like that or have someone say that to you? All right. Well, the answer to that question is that it came from your heart. Right? It came from your heart. And so, you know, maybe the next time you say something like that and, and you just say, I I'm sorry, that, that, that came from my heart. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that may or not be good advice, <laughs> but it's true. See, our words are the truest indicator of our heart. Because when it comes to your words, the heart of the matter is your heart. When it comes to your words, the heart of the matter is the heart. Our words are the truest indicators of the content of our heart. What is stored and lodged in our heart eventually comes out of our mouths. And so I want us to just take a few moments this morning to, to kind of take a look at our hearts as an indicator of why we often say the things that we say. Because it's out of the overflow of the mouth, out of the overflow of the heart, rather, the mouth speaks. So 
I want us to, to consider three things this morning that I think largely determine the content of our heart. And I want us to think about that as we think about how that influences how we talk. So number one, I want us to think about what is it that we allow in our heart? Because what we allow into our heart eventually is going to come out of what? Our mouth. All right. What we allow into our heart is eventually going to come into uh, existence through our words. And so I want us to think about what is it that we allow into our heart? Because everything that I allow into my heart ultimately gets lodged there and eventually it's going to come out. And so as we're thinking about how do we allow God, right? It has to be God at work in us. We can't just do it ourselves. But how do we partner with, how do we position our lives so that God can work in such a way that He transforms the way that we talk, right? Because the heart of the gospel is transformation, right? It's, it's God declaring us righteous, declaring us not guilty when we come to Him in faith and trust His provision of salvation through Christ. But it's also then God's work ongoing of continuing to save us by transforming us into His likeness, of making us more like Jesus, right? That's the, 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 the goal of God for your life. The call of the gospel is to become like Christ. Not through trying harder, not through effort, human effort alone, but by allowing the Spirit of Christ to work in us, to make us look more like Him so that we can reflect Him to the world. And what we allow into our heart has a great impact on that work of transformation. And so everything that you take in affects your life. What you hear, right? The things that you choose to hear. We all hear things that we can't help, but there's things that we can. Everything that we hear, conversations, the music that we listen to, everything that we hear gets lodged into our heart. What we see gets lodged into our heart. The things that you're looking at, television, movies, whatever you experience in life, and you're online, Right? Everything that you see ultimately gets lodged in your heart. What you read gets lodged not only in your mind, but in your heart. And here's the thing. For a while, we can sort of cover that up, right? For a while that we can, you know, we can take things in and we can say, it's not affecting me. I, I can look at this. I can listen to that. And it doesn't affect me, right? Have you ever thought that, said that, or maybe heard someone else say that? Right? I, it, it won't affect me. I, I can handle that, but it but you can't because it gets lodged in your heart. I have a good friend from Kentucky and, and he often said this. He said, what, what, uh, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket. All right. So for you that are not familiar with the fact that people used to have to actually get their water out of a physical well, right? And they would drop a bucket down into the well and they would fill the bucket up and then pull it up. And so this picture is kind of great for us. This is what's down in the well, what's in our heart eventually will come out of our mouth. And so as we're thinking about how do, I, how, do I, how do I see God's transformation work in my mouth, in my words, in my talking, it begins by thinking about what is it that I'm allowing into my heart? What is it that I'm consuming? What is it that I'm taking in? What's being stored up into my heart? Because what's in my heart will come out of my mouth. Number two, I want us to think about what do we think about? All right. And here's a little bit less obvious one, because what we think about is really, really important to our life, but also to our words. What we think about, what we dwell on, will not just affect what we do, but what we say. And here's the thing about our thoughts. Our thoughts are that sort of private place of our life, right? Where only you know what you're actually thinking. We can guess what we think other people are thinking, right? We do that all the time, don't we? But we really don't know someone else's thoughts. Only you know your thoughts. Your mind is a world that only you know. And God, of course, right? He knows your thoughts even before you think them. But what we think about eventually will affect our life. Our minds are so powerful, right? You have this incredibly powerful piece of equipment that God has put between your ears, all right? It is extremely powerful, and it has great power to affect your heart. And so what we think about, what we allow our minds to dwell on, will have a great, great impact on our words. Eventually, if we think about something long enough, it's up here, eventually our mind's going to form it into a word, it's going to travel down a nerve to our tongue, and it's going to pop out of our mouth. Paul gave us some really good insight, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, when it comes to ordering our thought life. 
Right? Because our, our thought life is something that, that we can bring under control through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so how we think, how we choose to think, is really, really important to our whole life as followers of Christ. Not just for our words, but certainly for our words. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said, Finally, my brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, I want to suggest... Stop. And I know there's a typo there. If there's anything excellent, it should be anything excellent. Um, but let's just kind of walk through that. Paul says, I want you to think about how you think. And he says, think about things that are true. How do we do that? How do we think about things that are true? Well, we start with God's Word, right? We know God's Word is truth. And so he says, if you're going to change the way that you talk, if you're going to change the way that you live, you have to change the way that you think. And that begins by filling your mind with truth. All right, so we want to think about things that are true. And, you know, Satan, he loves to deceive us. He is the deceiver. And he loves for us to think incorrectly. All right, and so we always want to step back and think, are the things that I'm thinking, are they true thoughts? Or are they not true thoughts? Are they honorable to Christ? Am I allowing things in my mind that are honorable or not? Are I allowing things in my mind that are just? Things that are pure? Are the things that I'm dwelling on, are my thoughts pure? Right? Again, no one else knows your thoughts, but eventually they will, right? Because eventually our thoughts become our words, and our words affect our whole life. He says not only should we think about what is pure, but things that are lovely, things that are commendable, things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise. He says, fill your mind with these things. Let those things be the things that you think about and dwell on, because how we think affects how we live. How we think affects how we talk. And so... When it comes to our words and understanding why it is that we say things that we often wonder, where did that come from? Well, it comes from our heart and our heart is largely affected by what we allow into it, what we think about. But then thirdly, who we allow to sit on the throne of our heart. Your heart has a throne. So if you can just sort of mentally picture that, your heart has a throne, a seat of rulership. And because of the fact that we've all inherited a sin nature, all of us have a tendency, all of us have a desire to sit on the throne of our own heart. All of us want to be in control of our own life. But who we allow to sit on the throne of our heart will greatly influence how we talk. Here's the thing. For those of you that are followers of Christ, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, right, the rightful ruler of your heart is not you, but God. The rightful ruler of your heart, of your life, is not you, but God. Because, you see, the gospel is not just a call to go to heaven one day. It's not just even a call for your own transformation to become more like Christ. The gospel is a call to live in and for the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he announced that the kingdom of God was coming, right? The rule and the reign of God. And he announced that it was here in him. And of course, we know that one day Jesus is coming again to establish his rule and his reign on this earth. But even now, God is establishing his rule and his reign in the hearts of those who know him and love him and follow him. And God calls you and I as his children to see ourselves as citizens of his kingdom. And that means God is the rightful king, the ruler of our life. Right? And so this gospel, this glorious message that Jesus came proclaiming, and then not only did he proclaim it, but he died in our, in our place for our sins. He rose from the dead. And he says, this gospel, this message is the gospel of a kingdom. And God is establishing his kingdom, his rulership. And he wants to establish that in our hearts and in our lives. And until we realize that God deserves to be the king of my life, that he deserves to rule and reign on the throne of my heart, we're never going to fully be able to experience the life God's called to us to. And it will affect how we talk. God deserves to rule and to reign on the throne of our hearts. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 
as Paul was, was uh, praying for the church in Ephesus. And what I love about the book of Ephesians is that Paul includes some of his prayers that he prayed for them. And I, I think it was probably a really, really great encouragement to them when they read this letter to know that Paul, who had spent three years with them, who loved them deeply, who cared about them, was praying for them. And here's what he prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. He says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in Him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And so as he prayed for them, he says, I pray that Christ will become more and more at home in your heart. That he will become more and more established on the throne of your heart and in your life. That he will become increasingly more of who you think about, who you dwell on, and ultimately who you give control of your life to. Right? We all have this tendency, we all have this desire to be in control, to call our own shots, to do things our way. And the culture that we live in, it celebrates that. It says life is about you, life is for you, you're the point of life, so do what you want. Live however you desire, make yourself happy. You are what matters most. All right? And although you are a person of great value and importance because God created you in His image, He gave His Son to die for you, He loves you with this incredible love, but the point of life is not you, the point of life is not me, the point of life is God. In His kingdom. And so he says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Right? Giving up control requires trust, doesn't it? All right? When you get in the car with someone and they are driving, you are giving them what? You, you are investing in them a measure of trust, whether you realize it or not, right? Right? You probably don't always think about it. But you're trusting them with your life. You're saying, I, I trust that you have the skills and the abilities to operate this vehicle safely. Right? Are you with me? You ever, you're like, I'm never getting in a car again. Right? Yeah. right? You're saying, I, I trust that, that you can control this vehicle. And so I, I'll sit in the passenger seat calmly. And, and I will trust that you can do this. And we place our faith, our trust whether we realize it or not. And in a similar way, God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to be willing to trust me enough to give up control of your life. Giving up control feels scary. But when we realize who we're giving control up to, it isn't scary at all. When I just say, I'm giving up control of my life to the one who loved me, the one who gave his son up for me, the one who redeemed me with the price of the blood of Jesus. When I understand that, he says, then I understand how greatly God loves me. And he says, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. May you understand how much God loves you. See, when you understand the depth of God's love for you, when you understand the willingness that He had to give His Son up for you, to pay the price of your sin, when you understand the affection and the care, the love that He has for you, then giving up control of your heart and your life will become more natural. And here's the thing. If we're going to control our tongues, if we're going to control the way that we speak, we have to give control of our heart to Christ. And I wish so desperately that we could just do this once, and it would be done forever. I wish this morning that all of us could say, you know what, I agree with that, that's right, I believe that. And so let's just all today say, God, you can have control of my heart, and now God's going to control my heart, He's going to sit on that throne forever, and I'll never have to deal with it again, but it doesn't work that way, does it? Right? This is a daily thing. Like walking with Christ, knowing Christ. He's never going to leave you, He's never going to forsake you, but the choice to allow Him to be on the throne of your heart is a choice that you have to make every single day. Christ lives in you, but you and I need to submit to Him daily. Jesus, when He taught His disciples how to pray, remember that time they said they'd heard Jesus pray, and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray the way that you pray. And as He taught them how to pray, He, he said, begin your prayers by acknowledging the relationship that you have with God by calling Him Father. He says, you can pray, Our Father. Jesus was saying, because of me and what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to give you the right to know God as your Father. But then he says, pray that God's name would be holy. Right? He says, begin prayer by worshiping God and saying, God, may your name be holy. May I be a worshiper of you today. 
And when we think about our words, our tongue, our mouth, this is something that we can pray every day when we think about who's on the throne of my heart. If I begin my day by praying, God, may I worship you today. And remember, we said yesterday, the greatest thing that we can do with our words is to praise God and to worship God. And so we can ask God, say, God, may your name be holy. And we can even be more specific when it comes to our words. And we can say, God, may your name be holy in the way that I talk today. God, God, may your name be holy. May I worship you. May I honor you. May I... Declare your worth and your value by the way that I speak, by the way that I talk. And, and then Jesus said, pray that my kingdom would come. All right? The rule and the reign of God. And that's not just a prayer for saying, God, I want your kingdom to come one day to this earth. You're saying, God, I want your kingdom to come here and now in my heart and in my life. That, that I'm willing to submit my life to your rule and to your reign. Right? The kingdom of God is here now in our hearts and our lives as God establishes his rule and his reign in our hearts. And God wants to rule and reign in your heart. And so he says, pray that my kingdom would come. And so you can pray that about your words. You can say, God, may your kingdom come today. May your, may your control, may your power, may your glory become in my words, in my speaking. God, may your purposes come out of my mouth. And then he says, pray that my will would be done. Pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you can pray that about your mouth. You can say, God, may your will be done in the way that I speak, in the way that I talk. We surrender our hearts to Christ when we pray that way. We're saying, God, I recognize that life isn't about me. I recognize that I have a tendency to make life about me. All of us do. But God, today, I, I want your name to be holy. I want your name to be magnified in my heart, and in my life, and in my words. I want your kingdom purposes to come in my life. I want to live for your purpose. I want to live for what matters. I want to live for the kingdom. And God, I want to do that by the way that I talk and in the way that I walk. May your will be done. Pray this for your heart. Right? It's a prayer that God will answer. Right? When we pray according to God's will, He will answer our prayers. Right? It's God's will that your tongue, that your mouth would come under His influence, under His control, and that you would use it to speak life instead of death. And so God will answer this prayer. We speak out of the overflow of our heart. Every single one of us speak from the heart. Our words are the most true indication of what's really in our heart. And so when we're tempted to think or say, I don't know where that came from, here's the thing. Other people might be able to say that, but now none of you can say that. All right? From now on, the rest of your life, you cannot say, I don't know where that came from, because now you know, right? It came from where? It came from the heart, all right? So when you say something and it shocks you and you just say, well, that came from my heart. We're going to control our mouth, all right? And this is such a crucial issue because James says if we can't control our mouth, we can't control our life, right? If we, if we don't allow God to bring this powerful part of who we are under his influence and under his control, not only can it inflict incredible damage on others, but it can destroy our own Life. Your words have incredible power. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. You have this great ability to influence your world. The people that you come in contact with, your family, your friends, the people that God places in your path, you have a powerful, powerful instrument to use to either bring blessing or cursing, to bring death or to bring life. And when it comes to your words, the heart of the matter is the heart. And so I want us to just maybe do a little bit of a heart examination today, all right? Uh, I've been asked a few times uh, if I'm a doctor. I am not a doctor, all right? Um, but let's uh, do a little heart checkup anyway, okay? Um, so how is your heart? Just, just being honest this morning, not, not thinking about somebody else, but just thinking about you. How is your heart? How's your heart doing? What are you allowing into your heart? Are the things that you're allowing into your heart causing you to desire to love and know and serve and worship Christ? 
Are the things that you're choosing to allow into your heart, are they pulling your heart towards God or away from God? Are there things? And listen, it's not about rules and regulations. It's not about you can't do this or you can do this, right? Like, that, that's not the point. The point is, if I love God, if I realize that He loved me, that He gave up His life for me, that He's called me into this living relationship with Him where I can call Him Father and know Him, where I can live for His kingdom and His glory and His purposes, right? If, if I realize that, Right, then this, ask, this question of what am I allowing to my heart, it's not about rules and regulations, it's not about law or legalism, it's about love. Right? If, if I love Christ and, and I believe that He loves me and I want to live for Him, then I do these things because I love Him. Right? So I ask this question out of love. How is your thought life? How is your thought life? What are you dwelling on? What are your thoughts leaning towards? Right? Here's the thing, you choose what you think about. And you can choose through God's power, as we talked about, to think about things that are good, that are pleasing, that are honorable, that are lovely. Choose to think about those things. And number three, are you daily asking God to rule and reign on the throne of your heart? And if you're not, I want to invite you to do that today and tomorrow and every day. Maybe just write it down somewhere where you'll see it. And say, am I asking God to take his rightful place in my life? Right? And, and I, again, I wish that we could just do that once and for all, but that's a choice that we have to make daily. God, am I allow, are you on the rightful place in my life, which is the throne of my heart? Because until then, we will not see the transformation occur in our speaking, right? Because it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. The tongue, incredibly powerful, but it never acts alone. It always acts under the influence of your heart. David wrote these words in Psalm 19, 14. He says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What a great prayer that we probably should all pray every day. He says, may the words of my mouth, may the, the thinking, the meditation, what I dwell on in my heart, may it be pleasing in your sight. What would happen if, if we chose to do that? What, what might happen in your life and in your heart, the influence that you have, if you chose to pray that prayer every day? Because when it comes to your words, the heart of the matter is your heart. And I want to ask God to do a deep work of His grace in our hearts this week. So that the way that we talk, the overflow of our heart will reflect God's incredible grace, His kindness and His love and His mercy and His goodness. And that's my desire for you. It's my desire for me. And so let's pray and ask God to do that. Would you bow your heads this morning? And uh, before we, before we uh, pray together, I just want to ask you this. How many of you just might say, you know, uh, as, as I've thought about these things, as I've listened to God's Word, I've been convicted in my spirit, in my heart from God that there's some ways that I've been speaking that aren't honoring to God and I want to see God change my heart. I want Him to take His rightful place on the throne of my heart. Would you just raise your hand just so I can pray for you? Thank you so much. All right, let me, let me just pray for you. Father, I thank you this morning that we've had the privilege to gather together as your family. Father, I thank you for uh, the wonderful blessing and privilege that, that you give us to be in this place where we can come together and uh, fellowship, to share life together, to share joy together, to share music. Father, to share laughter, to share encouragement, to share our fears and our struggles. And Father, we want to be real. We want to be honest with you this morning. Father, we confess that we often say things that we know don't honor you. Father, we recognize how hard it is to control our tongue. But Father, I pray this morning that we would realize that we need to allow you to do a deep work in our hearts if we're going to experience victory in our mouth. So, Father, I pray that, that everyone here this morning would take seriously a serious look into what they're allowing into their heart, that what they're choosing to think about, and who they're allowing to rule and reign on their throne of their heart. Father, all of us have a tendency to try to take that position in our own life, to be in charge, to call the shots. And Father, I pray that we would daily surrender to you, that you would rule and reign on the throne of our hearts and our lives, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our hearts and in our lives and in our words. 
Father, I thank you for everyone who had the courage just to raise their hand, to acknowledge before you, Father, that they want to see you do a work in their life. Father, I thank you that you see their heart. Father, I thank you that you know them and you love them. Father, may they know your graciousness to forgive. And Father, may they know your power to transform and to change. And Father, I pray that, that out of these times that we have together in your word, that you would do such a great work, that your kingdom would advance and that you would be glorified. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.